alcohol, my dad and me. Introduction. I've been wanting to create this content for those of you who are perhaps aware, have fallen victim to, deal with or simply just curious about addiction and how it can affect a person's life, in this case beyond repair. I'm not creating this content solely for the purpose of my own therapy or a way in which to share coping mechanisms. My main reason for creating the piece is to learn, understand, sympathise and eventually move forward from how destructive addiction can be. Not to mention how sad it is to lose a relationship between two people, regardless of their ties. I'm going to break this video up into chapters for you so it's easier for you to digest. One of the chapters will be on dopamine and habits. Another chapter will be on alcohol and personal addiction. And the third chapter will be a summary of both the first two chapters and ultimately how my relationship with my dad was affected by addiction and his addiction to alcohol. The legal drug, alcohol. So what I thought I'd do is I would break down for you the damaging effects that alcohol has on the body. So first of all, alcohol has got ethanol in it. And ethanol does extensive damage to cells. Ethanol converts into acetaldehyde, which is the poison that leads to the effects of being drunk. Acetaldehyde creates an imbalance or disruption in your cortex that creates the effect of being drunk. It significantly reduces the size of the brain and cognitive function and also ability. I live in the UK and as current statistics show, for my country at least, it is thought that all families across the UK have seen damages to individuals including fractured relationships, including deaths, and this has been due or related to alcohol. Ethanol causes substantial damage to the body and partly this is because it can pass through any cell in the body being water and fat soluble. This means that ethanol or acetaldehyde can cross the blood-brain barrier and there it can start to take the effect on the behaviours of the individual. The rationale of the individual decreases as well as cognitive function whilst the inhibitions and dysfunctions increase. This is because the neurological synapsis of the brain has been disrupted. One of the most important things to mention is that while ingesting alcohol, the liver immediately starts the conversion of ethanol to acetaldehyde and with that interruption of the blood-brain barrier, the frontal cortex, which is in charge of decision-making and sorting between rational and irrational thoughts, becomes impaired. As the individual receives a large dose of feel-good hormones, dopamine and serotonin, the immediate spike of these two hormones in the brain gives a sense of increase of pleasure. The person consuming the drink can also feel more confident and outgoing, whilst some inhibitions can lead to self-contained apathy. As we grow from child to adolescent into adulthood, the human brain is the strongest tool in our arsenal. Weighing in at only three pounds, the brain is made of neurons, nerve cells, and glia, cells that provide structure. Beyond that fires electric currents passing through over and over. It's alive with thoughts, processes, decisions, actions, reactions, contemplating, to name just a few. If the brain is a world in which each of us gets to discover as we grow and mature, then the experiences we encounter throughout our life are the maps in which we turn to. And those maps help us to navigate more confidently, courageously, and with purpose. The mind is like the compass to each of these maps, navigating through each one to find the correct path, or as best it can find a route or course. But if a poison infiltrates the mind, then the map becomes distorted. The way north is never quite clear, and the destination 
is never really reached. Whatever destination the mind arrives at eventually, it is at the cost to the individual. And that is where alcohol addiction is so criminal. It renders a person without their map. They may never arrive at their desired destination or discover new areas of the mind in which experiences can give them, robbing them of greater opportunities. The beginning. My earliest memories of alcohol affecting my dad were weekend children's films shown every Saturday morning. After we would go into town and grab a kid's happy meal or an ice cream. I think all kids look up to their parents in one way or another. I looked to my dad as the funny guy. He had the ability to make you laugh. He had an odd sense of humour and I suppose looking back now not everyone always understood that humour or got the jokes but I did and I loved them. We would always take walks together. We'd talk about the film as we walked. Sometimes we'd walk for miles far reaching to the edge of the town that he lived in. But every other weekend, my mum would drive us into town and wait at the agreed meeting place. 15 minutes, 20, 30, 40 minutes could pass and no dad. The film would have eventually have started and the minute upon minute upon hour would roll by. We'd turn back home and my mum frustrated and angry, cursing his behaviour. I knew what it was. Every fortnight he'd get his welfare check and that would be him for the next 48 to 72 hours, comatose and unresponsive. Phone call after phone call and no response. And if there was an argument, that would of course ensue. Phone call after phone call and no response. And if there was an argument to be had, of course that would ensue. Filling my mum's house with anger, alcoholic rage and screaming down the phone, I'd find space and peace in my room. You get used to that space on your own over time, but it was a good coping mechanism. Now, I don't repeat that story for you to feel sorry for me. I recall it to do two things. Firstly, I do it to raise an awareness to this addiction. Although by now I imagine that there are no families left that haven't been affected, hurt or lost loved ones to the addiction of alcohol. The second reason I mention this story that I have just reflected on is because I know that there are adult men and women, children and siblings who have had to endure the feeling of sadness when a parent, guardian or elder lets you down by giving in to their addiction. It is sad and it can take over your life. Trust me, I've been there many times myself. But what I will say is that this is not your fight. Win or lose, you can't put yourself in the firing line of someone else's mistake or bad choice. I've done that with my dad and lost. The way I look at addiction when dealing with a parent who has an addiction to alcohol or any other substance is that they have been suffering and coping with this personal issue a lot longer than you have had to deal with it. The addiction itself may very well be older than you are and therefore to throw yourself in front of the problem of the addiction when it's not your fight. You're only going to lose a battle that's been waging war with the victim of a drug or substance for many years if not decades. This is of course just my personal viewpoint and experience. It's not a fact that you as the child, sibling, friend or family can't have a positive impact on an addict's life and well-being. But I feel it's less likely to make any progress until the individual wants to quit or stop altogether. What the market demands versus what the market takes. When I started thinking about this chapter, I wanted to encapsulate how the marketing of alcohol has been pushed into everyday social situations, gatherings, celebrations and parties, or at least that's what we'd like to believe. Scratch the surface and we will see a different animal altogether. Alcohol is used often as a coping mechanism, a way to deload or de-stress from the general day-to-day. 
people now drink alone and the consumption of alcohol being consumed is in the home, far outweighing the volume of alcohol being consumed in bars, pubs and nightclubs across the country. We are the market. And the market demands for cheap spirits, wines and other alcoholic beverages. And this market is at an all-time high. We are marketed a shopping list worth of mixed varieties of alcohol in any supermarket, local shop and convenience store across the United Kingdom. But what does the market of alcoholic beverages actually take from us? In my case, you can't help but think about the things that could have been. I am lucky enough to have had great friends and also a thriving fitness and coaching business that has grown year in, year out. When I observe people, such as my friends and clients, I look at their relationships and their stories of loved ones. How I like to interact with people is to get an understanding of their history. Who do they admire and who do they love or aspire to be? I do this because it is natural for me to inquire about people's lives. It helps clients make a connection with me as their coach. But on a more subconscious level, I ask about a person's life because of the relationship they have with their family, parents, children, and even their friends. Why do I do this? Well, because I think in many ways it's a coping mechanism that quietens the hole I have in my own life. And I know that sounds sad, I get that, but it is the truth and the stark reality. The reality is that alcohol takes that person, the person you love and admire, the person you want to copy and aspire to be. In my case, at one point in my childhood, that person was my dad. However, what the market sells in abundance to us is a lifestyle of fun socialising, enjoyment and perhaps even wealth. But trust me, once a person falls down a dark mental hole, those lifestyle stories and tales that are sold to us are often far from the truth. Instead, we purchase that exact story of more fun and a more vibrant lifestyle in a bottle, only for it to be an addiction for some who are weak and vulnerable to it. Now, the story of socialising and enjoyment can be purchased and the market has us right where it wants us. We become the market because we create demand for alcohol. We fully invest in the belief system that alcohol is fun, vibrant and popular, not knowing or understanding how it affects your life, how it can reduce your brain function, damage and inflame tissues and cells alter personalities and alter lives. The effect that alcohol has had on my relationship with my father is that it has completely destroyed it to the point where communication is hard to come by. In my situation, alcohol spawned or triggered arguments that were hard to recover from. But these types of situations don't just come from pent-up anger towards one another. The arguments are a result of the addiction itself, the addiction to alcohol. The build-up of the addiction for my father would start the same every time. He would borrow money from me, his family, even his neighbours, just to feed the addiction. Somehow, he'd obtain alcohol, or the money for alcohol, and the binge would start. Often for days on end, until he was so drunk that he would fall into a comatose state, or even worse, have to be taken into hospital. This pattern has continued for decades, and I am ashamed to admit that I have purchased alcohol for him, just to shut him down for that split second. And without realising, I've been pulled into the addiction, as unknowingly, you become an enabler. If you hung a bowling ball from an elastic band, and waited long enough, you'd see that the band would start to stretch beyond its capacity. As it stretches, it starts to make tiny tears in the elastic and fray the edges. Enough time and the band is under so much tension that it snaps, breaks and the bowling ball drops. 
a dysfunctional relationship with anyone who has an addiction to a substance, especially alcohol, has the exact same experience as the elastic band. The addiction starts to stretch and pull at the relationship, wearing it to a point where edges start to fray. Love is a difficult thing sometimes, for the love of your once close and supportive bonds, they are broken by the continuous strain placed on the load bearer. I say load bearer because, like so many, I'm certain that my situation is unique. What had replaced family, friends, work and socialising, plus routine, was a self-loathing that is incredibly destructive to not only him and his health, but also to his living conditions, neighbours, and most of all, his self-loathing and pity destroyed our relationship. As the years went on and I grew older, I began to take more of an active role in his life. As his only son, I felt at first that it was my responsibility to try my best to support him. If I didn't at least try, I would perhaps feel guilt and I didn't want that feeling of I could have done more hanging over me. It would have been too difficult for me to face the reality that I could choose to ignore him. So I chose to involve myself more to perhaps try to control the alcohol intake and improve the basic need that all people deserve in order to live a more comfortable lifestyle than the life in which the alcohol was suppressing. But ultimately, I failed. The addiction was just too strong an influencer and impacted his life a great deal. This inevitably impacted our relationship, which grew worse over time. I have, in a previous video, spoken about my issues with anger, and I will link that video here for anyone who is interested in an open and honest reflection on one person's battle with overwhelming emotion that can, if allowed to, crowd or hinder a person's judgment. The reason why I bring this topic up is because I know that I'm not the only person who has anger within them, but also to clarify with people who don't understand is that anger isn't something where you go on a massive rampage and smash everything in sight until everything is left in ruin, like some sort of incredible hulk. No, anger within oneself is more subtle than just destruction. Anger is a very slow burner and is always bubbling away under the surface. It's an energy that doesn't need to be fed, it just is. What do I mean by that? Well, if you look at just a few successful CEOs, writers, actors, engineers, scientists, sportsmen and women, creatives, artists, you see that there is often fire there. You could call it a chip on one's shoulder or that they feel like they have something to prove. But the reality is, is that the energy they possess isn't a negative. It's a drive, a sense to want more, to achieve greater and perhaps do what other people couldn't. That's what anger is to me. It's a fuel cell that stays fully charged because I have learned to harness it. The more I was pushed, forced into a corner, lost, beaten down, walked over, the more I rose to the challenge and utilised that energy to achieve something positive in my life until everything was positive. Learning to practice gratitude. Batman is my favourite comic book superhero. He has a dark past that changed his life from childhood from losing both his parents to continuing his father's legacy of Wayne Enterprises, he was able to withstand the pain of his past. On one hand, he could have just as easily taken another route and grown bitter, used his hatred as a reason to be a victim. All heroes need an enemy, as light needs dark, triumph needs turmoil, and Batman used his own personal injustice to fuel his anger and hatred against evil and for justice to prevail. Where the vulnerable are at a disadvantage to the villain, the advantage of the hero is to use the anger as a torch to provide light 
we all have a common enemy and mine was not my anger. In fact, anger is what got me here. It's more of a survival mechanism than it is a hindrance. No, my enemy is not alcohol, but my enemy is processed food companies, drinks and beverages companies who market their product to you, keeping us hooked and addicted. We now live in a world where AI and space exploration can see humanity reaching new heights. But I fear that we are still getting the basics wrong. Let's face it, the food corporations are still winning their forever relentless attack on people. They sell you a dream and a status to relax with friends, create memories, be seen to be cool. But I've never seen a heavily intoxicated individual fly a fighter jet or come up with a million dollar idea. I don't see alcoholics paving the way for the future generations or the economy, but I do see companies selling a legal drug. I do see them taking your money, your health, and perhaps one day your life. The relationship between myself and my father has now spanned three and a half decades. In that time, it has gone through pretty much every feeling of emotion a person could wish to endure. Everything from happiness, sadness, loss, anger, regret, stupidity, and I'm sure many more. But life is a teacher, and you're going to get taught, one way or another, like it or not. So what do you learn when you are in a forever ongoing battle of falling in, falling out with a parent who is also an addict. Many people over the years have told me to leave the relationship, let sleeping dogs lie. But for me, at this stage, as a man at 35, I have let a lot of things go and learned to forgive. And if I can't forgive, then I need to overcome, surpass and close that chapter to my life close the door on yet another part of our relationship that will always be lost. But to not stay in his life whilst he is alive is weakness itself. And I'm not weak. I'm not made of weak material. I'll give you an example. I'll tell you a story. Two schoolboys grew up together in the same street. They went to the same school, had similar interests, and they both took great pleasure and admiration for each other. As they grew older, the relationship between them, although strong, became strained. The older one of the two started to show more interest in alcohol, fell in and out of work, and became self-centred and bitter. The other friend, the younger one of the two, became a toolmaker. In fact, he became so good that he was promoted to a master toolmaker. As the years went on, both friends, although still fond of one another, grew apart. The toolmaker tried everything that he could to help his friend, but the addiction had become too much of a problem and the friendship grew apart. In their early 20s, the toolmaker became sick and was diagnosed with cancer. As the disease grew within him, so did the loss of his friend. If he could just see him one last time, it would resolve the issues and perhaps repair what they had lost. The toolmaker sent for his friend, asking him to pay him a visit. But when the message was passed to the older, more selfish friend, he refused the toolmaker. He was too ashamed to close the chapter on their lost relationship and was willing to say goodbye from a distance. Without ever resolving their differences and allowing the tall maker to die. I tell you this simple story because it's a true story. But rather than the characters having different outcomes, the reality is, is that the characters are the same person. My father was that tall maker. It was his profession in his early career. The cancer was the addiction and it destroyed the toolmaker's life, livelihood and career. The older, 
more selfish friend was my father's character once the addiction had taken its toll. So what do you learn from it? My interest in my father's addiction came from a number of places personal to me. But one of the most intriguing discoveries I found on this journey was the dopamine system and how our brains are easily hardwired to becoming addicted to anything. Dopamine is a hormone that gives us drive and reward. It's also a neurotransmitter, meaning that it's one of the hormones that acts as a messenger, shuttling information across the brain to and from nerve fibers. In other words, it's a hormone that plays a role in transferring information across the brain. As I said before, dopamine is a reward hormone and is secreted when we achieve something that demands reward. In our ancient history, humans would have been rewarded for hunting, killing and eating our food, procreating and engaging in sex, forming relationships and communities. But in the 21st century, our world is a polar opposite to the hunter-gatherer we were 10 to 15,000 years ago. Our frontal cortex is submerged, bombarded and overwhelmed by marketing and clever psychological advertising. We bury our heads in the sand and burrow our minds in the holes designed for us to fall into. We idolise the shiny, new, intoxicating paraphernalia of the day. We worship false idols and the idea of hard work has become unfashionable and not the norm. So, when it becomes all too much for us, we delve into the poison for slowly killing our mind, keeping it hazed and disordered. Within that disorder, there lies the poison which we drink, which enables the dopamine high that we so need to form a temporary false sense of achievement. That becomes addictive, and that is the definition of a drug. But what happens when the drug stops, or worse, when the dose of the drug isn't enough? In my experience, dealing with my father on the downward spiral after a binge, which can last for three to five days, sometimes even a week, the come down is the worst part of the addiction because the person is in a complete mess. Disorientated, agitated, craving sugar and junk food, and that's just the immediate come down or hangover from the alcohol. In the days to follow, my father's addiction will change his characteristics also. He becomes short-tempered, irritable, rude and completely selfish. This is where the body is rejecting the alcohol and recovering from the bin session of a drug. This is where the body is rejecting the alcohol and recovering from a binging session of that drug. The legal drug alcohol continued. Alcohol is a drug. The definition of a drug is an individual who suffers with addiction caused by a substance such as alcohol. This addiction creates a neuropsychological disorder in the brain when the intense urge to use the drug creates a feeling of reward. Although drug abuse and being addicted to a drug such as alcohol can have substantially harmful side effects on the individual's life. Of course, abusing any drug can be harmful to anyone, but being addicted to a drug such as alcohol can have substantially harmful side effects on the individual's life. But alcohol is the most widely used, widely available and most addictive substance other than cigarettes. In the UK, smoking has become a drug habit that's heavily taxed, expensive to buy, demonised by the press and government as it should be and thought of as a filthy habit. But why does alcohol not have the same outcome as tobacco and cigarettes do? To answer this question, I feel that we need to be honest with ourselves for a moment. Alcohol is a part of being social and we are very much social creatures. We thrive in environments that are socially charged and drink and beverage companies are well aware of this. An interesting interview I watched proved to me the extent of how alcohol is so drummed into our social psychology. We are often forced to drink even if we don't want to. 
I remember the interview I watched that shared the psychology of British culture and alcohol. Stephen Bartlett, a successful businessman, entrepreneur, podcaster, was at a swanky French restaurant in London with a friend. The waiter took their order and asked them what kind of wine they wanted with their food. Stephen replied that he didn't want any wine with his food, just water, thanked the waiter and went back to his conversation with his friend. The waiter, stunned at Stephen's comment, went to fetch a bottle of the house wine and returned attacking Stephen's request and said, this is not wine, it's art. This comment immediately resonated with me. As a person who chooses not to drink alcohol, I get the exact same treatment as Stephen did. We are the few and we are aliens to the plenty. It's obvious to me that the drinking culture is here to stay and that, although I applaud anyone who defies the trend, know that you probably are likely to be alone in this instance and that you can be proud of that, knowing you are one in only a few who choose not to drink. For those who decide to drink, I encourage you to have fun and be safe. Realise that this social drug is addictive and can have serious side effects on a person's mental and physical health. As the book Sapiens, A Brief History of Mankind by Yuval Noah Harari suggests, perhaps prehistoric times were better for us. Of course, there would have been the threat of death and possible days of not eating. However, it is for us humans as it is for all mammals. Life is hard and challenging, but rewarding when we win the hunt, when we mate, procreate, and nourish our young.